Nehemiah chapter 4. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we build the wall, he was raw. Alright, chapter 3 and 4 are not necessary in order. Chapter 4, they're talking about, you know, they're building the walls. Well, we finished all the way to chapter 3, all the way from sheep to sheep. So not, uh, not always are your chapters in the Bible in a chronological order. They may be out of whack. So if you're reading your Bible, that may be the answer why you can't understand what's going on. Nothing wrong. It's just recorded later. He was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Well, if Ezra and Nehemiah pictures uh, the prophecy of what's going to happen later on, maybe they're going to start building, and maybe it's going to be mocking. Listen, everybody's mocking the Jews today. They're a great part for part jokes. And, and he spanked before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, now, it doesn't say he says before the Jews. It says before his own brethren and the army of Samaritan. I mean, is what would be recorded? Is he saying this to the Jews too, or is he scared to say it to the Jews? You know, there are some people that will mock you, and they'll mock you to others, but they won't dare say it to your face. It's got to get back to you by some other forms. And somebody's got to mock you by other people and they can't do it to your face there ain't much to be said and usually they can't face you because it's a lie usually what do these feeble Jews now maybe they're there on scene right now watching them build the walls and they're right there and looking hey what are those Jews going to do well, chapter 3, the end of the chapter, they're going to finish. That's what they're going to do. You know, there are sand ballots today looking at the church and say, what are those feeble people going to do? And not many of them are going to finish the job. Very few will. Will they fortify themselves? According to chapter 3, yes, they will. As I said, chapter 4 is, is written in between chapter 3. So as they're building, you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to build up the city? They're going to build up those walls. Listen, it looks impossible. The walls have been torn down in chapter 2 or 1. Nehemiah gets on his animal. He's walking around. He comes to a spot he can't even cross. Because all the rubbish, all the stones and, and wood and everything is just piled up. He couldn't go any further. So the people are going, what are they going to do? And with God's help, they get it done. Will they make an end in a day? I don't understand what complete. I mean, is he trying to say, you know, that whole work going to be done today or... Is he talking specifically that day? I don't know. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? And the answer is yes. Are we going to have a revival? In Nehemiah's time, yes. They're going to rebuild. They are taking heaps from rubbish and building up the cities according to Nehemiah chapter 3. It gets done. In our time, you're taking what is done and you're tearing it down to rubble. And people don't know church history, neither do they know church prophecy. That Paul and Jesus and John all say the church is going to end in apostasy. It doesn't say it's going to get better. So we are in reverse of Nehemiah 3 and 4. Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was by him, Sambalat. And he said, 
So evidently that they're, they're standing there watching these guys work. And they're ridiculing the Jews for this great work that they have before them. Remember, Jews are small people. They ain't husky. Samson was a, I don't want to say a fluke because he was of God. But there weren't too many Samsons. There wasn't too many Davids. There weren't too many King Saul's tall men of Jews. They're short little people. Even that which they build, what they've done so far, up to Nehemiah 4, verse 3, chronological order, what they're looking at right now, the wall is, in chapter 3 it's done, chapter 4 is not done. What they've done so far, they're saying, if a fox go up, he will even break down their stone wall. If this little tiny animal comes up and accidentally hits the wall, it's going to come tumbling down. It ain't going to work. That's what, that's what it's saying. But yeah, it lasted at least 470 years. And to Titus, even longer. So they're just mocking. The world will mock. Hear, O oh our God, for we are despised. Chapters 1 through 3. And turn their reproach upon their own head. So, what does reproach mean? Reproach means that they're being mocked, they're being made fun of, they're being, they're being hassled, they're being, ah, you can't do it. They're being blamed. Evidently, we, we've changed characters here. We've turned to Nehemiah now. And you can, according to Psalms, you can, according to the writings of David, you can, the Old Testament, say, God, go after them. Where in the New Testament, we are told to love thy enemies. We are told by God, God has vengeance. Not us. We don't follow the golden rule. Do unto others as others do unto. That, that's foolish. The Old Testament, they were allowed. Because not only did they mock the people of God in chapter 4, but they're mocking God. And give them for prey in the land of captivity. In other words, Lord, turn them over to the Babylonian government. That's what they're saying. And that's not P R A Y. That's P R E Y. That, you know, that's you know, an animal who's being attacked by another animal is going to be eaten. That's what the prey is there. And cover not their iniquity. Well, we're covered under the blood, but there is no blood here. Not the blood of Christ. He says, let their iniquity stand out. Let it be open. Imagine a Christian praying that prayer. That defies the Christianity of Jesus Christ and Paul, because we're told to go all over the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is that men will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent and uh, have their sins washed. And let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. Look at that. That's the difference between the Old and the New Testament. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. And here's where Nehemiah, which we know God, God steps in and takes it personal. As Jesus Christ talking to Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus, why persecute thou me? Well, wait a minute. Paul never persecuted Jesus. But yet, Jesus says, thou persecutest me. 
So when these the this and and to and to buy are making fun of the Jews and and harassing them and making jokes and mocking them and all that, they're not mocking the Jews. They're mocking God. Because we've seen through Ezra, we've seen through Nehemiah, we've seen God working through the king. God has sent them to do this work. And they're doing God's work. That they told him to do. So built we the wall. And the wall was joined together. And the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. So they're still building. They're dedicating. Or dedicated. But it came to pass that when Sambiah and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard the walls of Jerusalem were being made up. That doesn't mean, you know, they're making up a story. It means that they're, all the rocks and all that are going up into a wall, into a fortress. And the breaches began to be stopped. The holes in the wall. They're becoming solid. They're becoming a wall. In other words, these feeble little Jews that the foxes come up and knock it down. Oh boy. Now we're in trouble because that wall is getting finished. That wall is being fortified. That wall is being a wall. <laughs> We better stop laughing and stop kidding ourselves right now. The work is being done. Began to be stopped that they were very raw. They haven't stopped them yet. And conspired all of them, the enemies, to gather to come and to fight against Jerusalem to hinder it. Okay? Our big mouth, our joking around ain't going to do it. Now we're going to fight. Fist for fist. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. But there's no recorded battle. There's no recorded fight. It's just words. When you're, do, when you're doing the work of the Lord and people come up, oh, I'm going to call the cops on you, or, or I'm going to have you arrested, or I'm going to get somebody to beat you up. A lot of it is just words. They, a lot of people, they're too scared, they're too cute to do anything. And the thing is, if you quit because of just words, then you're the failure. Had the Jews stopped up to now between verses 1 and and nine, just because of words, just because of no action, it's all talk. It would never got done. And then the devil would be in victory because the work would be stopped. For every time that someone harasses on the street by their big words, you know, that big air horn on, on the vehicle is supposed to stop and make me pack up and go home. The idiot teenagers that, that yell out the window, Lucifer rules! That's, sorry. Didn't know better. Everyone back up. Let's go home. Now you don't know what it is to be really a Christian. And what you do is you're really hurting the people more than you're doing any good. That's just words. It's just words. Don't quit. You say, what if it gets physical? Not a lot of times it won't. If it does, then you... Listen, our, our, uh, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. And there is much rubbish... So that we're not able to build the wall. We've come to a point in this wall where it's finished in chapter 3. We come in chapter 4. We got the wall. We're going and we come to a spot. There's just so much garbage. 
There's so much trash. Nehemiah, we can't go any further. And today the world takes that trash and that rubbish and builds it right into the wall. If the enemy doesn't stop them, the world takes the trash and the rubbish and adds it to the church. That's why we're in a mess we're in merit. Listen, one of those churches, if you're to study the, the seven churches that John writes to, one of the meanings thereof means much marriage. It's when the Catholic Church and the church married themselves together and became the harlot. Our adversary said, they shall, they shall not know, neither see till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. Now here comes the adversary, just trash. I mean, we can't build any, we can't go any further. And the enemy's coming in and saying, you're not going to see me. And then when you see us, we're going to be right in the middle of you guys, and we're going to attack you from inside. You're going, we're going to get you when you least expect it. There's a lot of work to be done, and it, it looks too much overwhelming. And now we got the enemy that's saying, and we're about to be discouraged. Great men of God have been discouraged because of the enemy and because of the work. Discouragement is a fact of life, and is what you do with discouragement will lead on or failure of your life. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, and they said unto us ten times, for all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Ten different times they've come up, and they're, they're not using sticks and stones. There was an expression when I grew up, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. That's a bunch of doo-doo. And that Model that saying defies scripture because your big fat ugly mouth can say something and ruin a lot or do much damage that sticks and stones will never do. You can defeat a council, you can defeat a work, you can defeat a Christian, you can defeat anybody with your big fat mouth if you keep it going long enough. You ever wonder what happened if Job and his three friends kept going on it for another 42 chapters without God intervening? What if for those, I think it was it, 38 chapters that him and his friends are going on, what if his wife would have been right there in the midst of it with the, four guy, with the three guys? With her big mouth. Don't tell me she didn't have a big mouth. Curse God and die. Well, that bitch that really did a lot good. He even says in, in one of the chapters, my breath is strange with my wife. She ain't by my side. She didn't use sticks and stones. Yet I know Christians personally in my own personal life that their big mouth has almost made me stop. Words do a lot of damage. Say the wrong word at the wrong time. James talks about the tongue. You can ruin an entire marriage just by your open big mouth. And right now the mouth is going inside these Jews here from the enemy and it's making them fair, it's making them feeble. They're starting to think maybe we can't. And here we come up to this rubbish and like, maybe we can't finish. Satan knew that that rubbish was coming. 
Satan knew that that war was coming to a point where it would be much hard labor to do. And he knew exactly the point, And he knew exactly when to tell his people, all right, now start opening up your big mouth. Satan is no idiot. He's been going at it with man since Adam and Eve. And has been victorious. Notice they didn't pull no guns, they didn't pull no swords, they didn't pull no weapons. It's all been the big mouth. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall. And on the higher places I even set the people after their families with swords, their spears, and their bows. The Jews are being armored. Nehemiah said, you know what? We're going to go into the arm armor tree now. Right now, they're just using their big mouth. But this is not a New Testament principle. Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and Nehemiah has given them swords and spears and bows. <laughs> His is carnal. His is do or die bloodshed to the enemy. Enemy gets in the way, we'll kill him. The born again Christian, we to pray for him and help him. The Roman Catholic Church, we've got the swords, we got the spears, we got the bows, we got the swords. Oh, I'm not supposed to speak about the Roman Catholic Church. And this is how they bring their Nehemiah kingdom in with bloodshed to those who go against the math, who those who go against the pulpitry, all those that go against our church, we will kill them. They get it out of the Old Testament. Fox's Book of Martyrs are written under Nehemiah chapter 4 where the men of God grab the swords and the, and the swords and the spears and the bows. That shows you that the Roman Catholic Church is out of period, out of time. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, Be ye, be not ye afraid of them. Well, that's easy to say. They were afraid of them. But remember the Lord. Imagine. Imagine. A Christian going to a shrink with their problems. Don't be afraid. Take this pill. No God, no Jesus. Don't be afraid. Come back next Tuesday at 11 o'clock and tell me more. At $200 an hour, if not more. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Again, that terrible doesn't mean mean, nasty. That means he's an awesome, wonderful, terrifying, inspired God that can kick an entire nation's butt that won't listen. Now keep your people. Egypt. And fight for your brethren, Jews, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Now, America runs to that verse. I got to get a gun. I got to fight the government. We're in the wrong time period, brother. Peter and Paul say we are to obey the powers that be, Nero, and we are supposed to pray for them, Nero. Find me one place where Paul picks up a weapon and starts fighting. Find me a place where Jane picks up a weapon and started fighting. Peter picked up a weapon and started fighting. God rebuked him. 
He said, Peter, put that sword down. Where do you see a Christian fighting? And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, God said, God's work with these, these enemies was, you're just a big airbag. Poof, nothing happened. And the Jews looked around and saw that, you know, this guy has a sword, this guy has a spear. This, hey, we can win. Oh, yeah, I did forget God. But I know that God's going to work our purpose and... The people began working again. They began going back to God. They, and the enemies like, losers. And brought their counsel to not. They returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. Well, they had stopped working. You know why the church is failing today? Because they stopped working. They're not doing what God told them to do. Oh, you're, you're wrong, Mr. Hayward, because we're out there, we're, we're winning people to Jesus Christ. We've got this, we've got that. Everything of devil's way and not God's way. You're using the world's means to get them the world's salvation, which is not Jesus Christ. And the way that the church is using today, if it's not knocking on doors, if it's not preaching, if it's not gospel tract, if it's not the King James Bible, if it's not the way of holiness, and they turn around and say, we got 55,000 quadrillion people saved last week, glory to God, half of them were baptized, and three quarters of them were called to ministry, I question whether they were saved or not, because it was not God's way. You can use all the wordless books you want. If it's not the book, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, how can you get them saved by using a wordless book that the Bible says you're to show them the book? And half the people that use that wordless book are so lazy they don't want to memorize scripture. So red is for blood, white is for purity, blackness is for sin, and gold is for Jesus. You want to get saved now? Really? Let's say this prayer. Lord God, I got one! And you didn't use nothing. You didn't use no scripture. Listen, the wordless book is good if you know Scripture and you can quote Scripture. Write Scripture. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears and, sh and shields and the bows and the habergines, which is a type of weapon, something. I've heard a couple stories on the habergines. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. Half the people were building a wall. Half the people had armor. And the rulers were behind it. <laughs> what were the rulers doing? ruling I guess that's 12 inches that's a good job <laughs> I don't know that's what it says rulers why did they need the shields the swords and abogenes and all that they didn't need a to say God's on our side yeah but you know it reinforces the people Look over at those weaponry, look at those soldiers and say, God is on our side. The enemy looks over and like, better not mess with them. Because <laughs> it tells you something that Sam Ballot and now you worth mentioning the rest of their names. They, they don't have no weaponry. 
but their big fat mouth. Let me ask you something. What weapon did Satan use in the serpent for Eve? He didn't use nothing. What weapon did da did Satan use against Satan? I mean, did Satan use against David the night he took a walk on the on the on the porch? All there is is big fat air. But you know what? There are some cases in the Bible that big fat air won without a sword, without a spear. Without a shield. So, judgment. Eve, come forward. Hi, Eve. How you doing? Did the devil make you do it? Yeah, he made me do it. And what weapon did he hold to your head? No weapon. So how did he make you do it? He talked to me. David, come forward. Okay, the night that you saw Bathsheba washing herself, devil make you do it? David wouldn't say, because he, listen, he said he was a sinner, but if he would say, yeah, the devil made, okay, what did the devil hold to your head? Nothing. In the thick of the battle of Satan, a lot of times he doesn't have to use anything. I'll tell you when he does have to use armor. On a dedicated man that loves God and wants to do right. I'll give you a name that Satan had to use. Weaponry. Job. Only after God said, you, you see Job, and I'm paraphrasing this, but that man sues evil and does right and loves me. Yeah, really, God? You you take that hedge away. We'll see how much he loves you. You know, the horses are gone, the camels are gone, the sons are gone. And then he gets boils and, and uh, looks like a, a, a worm-fested kind of disease. That is Satan's weaponry against a man that loves God and retains his integrity. Right now, Satan's just using a big, fat mouth. How many people did Adolf Hitler kill personally? But how many will he be charged at his judgment for his big mouth ordering all the Jews to be killed? Doesn't the Bible say in the power of the tongue is life and death? Haman in the power of the king's tongue said, okay, Hang them. That which built it on the wall, and they that bear burdens, carried away junk, bricks, bought bricks, bought rocks, carried mortar, empty bucket, brought water for the, for the guys to get a drink of water. That's the burdens. With those that laden, and you had to carry it. This is stuff you had to carry. Building this wall of God wasn't, boom, hocus pocus, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, there's the wall. It's on my toe. Ow. God, a little more over. It was hard, laborious work to build that wall. So don't think... Oh, Lord Jesus, please save me. And then my life is going to be hunky-dory. <laughs> Satan, you little smart little face. I get the Bible. I, I get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. No more problem. And you watch God say, okay, Satan, go. That's why he's giving us armor. The helmet. The, 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 the sandals. The breastplate. It's no easy work. It's 
It's not easy standing on the street corner and giving someone a gospel tract when they've got 400 proof stuff on their breath ready to knock you, paralyze you out, and you're telling them about, yeah, I know how to say, but man, people buy you a case of certs and trying to talk you out. Trying to witness, trying to do something about uh, for Jesus, and some ways interfering. Someone's uh, and listen. It's hard work when you're trying to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, and people from the inside your own troop are giving you a hard time. Everyone with one of his with one of his hands wrought the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. Kind of hard to build a wall trying to move a rock, and you got a sword over here. But it was done, and God did it. God always does the impossibilities. You give God the credit. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side. And so build it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And that's one of the very first memory verses that I ever memorized. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 18. That guy to blow the trumpet according to Ezekiel. He used to be. Listen. The guy. He just wasn't holding the trumpet. <laughs> just waiting. Nah. He's the one. Just rock up. Put it right. That the enemy I see? No, no. Just hobby will be bought. Don't do that again. You have another rock goes up there, he's watching out and hello that could buy. How you doing? I mean, you know, you have weird Hebrew names, right? You know, we do know that by now. And what he's doing, he's building a wall, he's looking around, he's watching for the enemy. Because Ezekiel said, even though Ezekiel, Ezekiel said that listen, the one that is supposed to be on the watch, if he doesn't warn the people with the trumpet. And the enemy comes, he's going to be charged. This is this guy. Listen, he he knows what Ezekiel said. I'm holding a trumpet. I got to build it. I got to keep watch because if we're building this wall, the army and the enemy comes in, God's going to charge me. He's going to make sure that rock belongs right in the soul. Okay, make sure no one. It wasn't no easy, pleasant thing to do this job. You know what you're supposed to be as a Christian? You're supposed to take these people that are along with you, building for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, listen, we're called lively stones in Peter. As we go out there and try to get these stones just right in the church, witnessing to them and uh, raising them up, we're to be, hey! That guy don't belong here. He's the enemy. That doctrine is the enemy. That scripture you got is wrong. Got to sound the trumpet. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. And we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. So there's distance between these people. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort, yeah, resort. Ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. While you guys are over there, you hear that guy blowing that trumpet, you come together. Drop what you're doing and get over here. And God is going to fight for us. So we labored in the work. And half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning, 6 a.m., till the stars appeared. They even worked beyond 6 p.m. The Jewish time is 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. As the sun's going down, the sun's already going down, the stars are appearing. They're getting the most of their day, plus some. Oh, I go to church this Sunday morning, nothing else. No Sunday night, no Wednesday night, evening, sir, no visitation, no, 
I, I do what I just have to do. That's not what the Jews were doing. And God recorded it through Nehemiah. Likewise, at the same time said I unto the people, Let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be guard to us and labor on the day. All right, when it's time to go to sleep, we're going to sleep together. I don't mean all in one big bed. We're all going to gather together like, um, oh, like a campground. Like the stage coaches, they would get all one big circle, and then they, you know, camp in the middle of the stage coach. No one could come in unless they came in through the guard and through the stage coach. No going off over there, to, you know. You're over there is right here with us. And don't you know that they knit themselves in unity? Don't they know that they're probably at the campfire? They're talking about God. They're talking about how good God did what they did that day. And they're probably teaching the law. And they're trying to just they're getting together. They're, they're, they're unifying themselves. They're becoming one as a group of people. They're getting to know each other. They know you don't give Hezekiah a bunch of beans to eat because they're too weak. He messes up the camp the whole night long. And you know, you don't go mess with uh, Helkiah's mother because she's, man, you mess with her and she she tear you high. You get to know each other. You become a family. They're a family in Jews, but they're a family knit together with a purpose for God. But yet, 12 o'clock Sunday, everyone disappears from each other. They don't see each other again until next Sunday, maybe Sunday school. But we are a family in God. I don't care about you to next Sunday. You don't have fellowship together. You don't have no time together. Because half the Christians, once they leave noon, you know, that magical thing, the car turns into a, into a pumpkin in the parking lot, and you go past noon, whatever it is, and you just go fellowship with the, wor with the worldly people. You had your Jesus moment. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, Saving that, everyone put them off for washing. Now, what's that tell you? The only time they took off their clothes was to bathe themselves or wash their clothes. They went to bed dressed. Early to, early to bed, early to rise, and get the wall done as quick as possible. If the enemy comes in the middle of the night, we're going to be ready. Looks like they didn't come at their wives at all during this time. Only time they took off their clothes was to wash. Kind of a fasting kind of period for God's work here. And yes, it's in the Bible that you're to wash your clothes and take them off every once in a while. And as we close another chapter of Nehemiah, even though the enemy's out there, you stay with God and God will take care of you.